want to continue the topic we began last week just to today to look at it from a different angle. We're still talking about the kingdom of God and in contrast really to the idea that some would say the kingdom of God is not a current reality. There are those in the religious world that would teach God's kingdom is yet to come. Well, last week we looked at that question from the uh, perspective of uh, did, did Christ fail to do what he said he would do? And of course that was to come to set up a kingdom. And we spoke about what the Bible says about God's ability to accomplish what he says he's going to do. And it's clear in both the Old and New Testaments that God's will can't be thwarted. If God says he's going to do something in a certain time frame, then it's going to happen no matter whether an individual or a group of individuals or a nation stands against him. As we learn from Psalm 2, uh, you know, the nations rage against God and, and uh, do all they can to, to uh, overcome him. And uh, Psalm 2 says God laughs at such an idea. That's the powerful God that we serve. So we're still talking about the kingdom. And again, we're asking the question this morning, is the kingdom of God a reality? A lot of verses once again to cover, so I may just refer to some without reading all of them. There's some outlines of the lesson out on the foyer table that have all the verses, so you can read them in their fullness later if you want. I'll probably read most of them, but uh, I'm impressed the older I get in the faith of just, if we'll just take the time to read the Bible and, and understand, at least look into what it says. A lot of these questions answer themselves pretty clearly. Once again, is the kingdom of God a current reality? We'll begin by making this point. John, speaking of John, the forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist, as he's referred to in Scripture, the baptizer. John, Jesus, and the apostles of Jesus all taught that the kingdom of heaven was at hand in their day. Now, if I use the phrase something is at hand, in our understanding, what, what am I referring to? Something's close, right? Yeah. It's at hand. I can grab it. Well, that's what the Bible, uh, it, even in Greek and Hebrew, it's the same idea. Jesus, John, and, his, and, John and Jesus and his apostles all taught the same fact. In Matthew 3, 2, it says, John preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then Jesus, shortly after his baptism, in Matthew 4, in verse 17, Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then by the time you get to Matthew chapter 10, there Jesus has gathered his followers, who I would affirm, you know, have been uh, becoming part of that kingdom, Jesus sends them out, and guess what? Jesus tells them to preach. That shouldn't be too much of a stretch, right? The forerunner of Jesus said the kingdom is at hand. Jesus taught the kingdom is at hand. So Jesus says in Matthew 10, 7, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven, or God, is at hand. And once again, we usually don't have any trouble with that kind of language, but when you have an idea in your mind or you've come to believe that the kingdom of God is something yet in our future, some 2,000 years removed from when Jesus said it was at hand, then you've got to start playing with the language. And then you start coming up with the, the ideas that, well, God doesn't look at time like we do. Well, there's a, uh, that's not true. We'll have a lesson about that someday. Yes, I'm aware of Psalm 90, where a, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. But the point there isn't that God was saying, I, I, I don't communicate to you in language you don't understand. It's just that whether it's a thousand years or a day, God will keep his word. Amen. The, the lexicons or dictionaries for this very phrase at hand, Vine, W.E. Vine said, when this word is used... And it's one word in the Greek. But at hand, when it's used of time, refers to things that are imminent. It's just like the Bible, how it uses it in Matthew 26, verse 45. In Matthew 26, verse 45, Jesus has been praying in the Garden of Gethsemane shortly before uh, he's to be crucified. It says in verse 45 it says then he came to his disciples and said to them are you still sleeping and resting 
Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. What happened shortly after they left the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus was betrayed into the hand of sinners. Jesus meant what he said. The time of my betrayal is at hand. It was close, not two millennia away. The question I have to ask then, in the clearness of what John and Jesus and the followers of Jesus taught, that the kingdom was at hand in their day, are we to believe that when the kingdom, when the, the kingdom that these men spoke of as being at hand is at least 2,000 years from being a reality when they said it? That makes no sense. And it's 2,000 years and counting. So that's one thing to think about. Jesus and his followers said it was imminent in their day. Jesus, we learn from the scriptures, proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom and referred to his disciples as being part of it. See, sometimes Bible study is as simple as paying attention to the tenses of the words that's used. We do that in English all the time. If, if I would say to you something like, well, I went to the store, or I am going to the store, or I will go to the store, you understand various things, right? If I say I went to the store, that means I've already done it. If I am getting ready to go to the store, then you assume, well, it's probably going to be within a short amount of time that's going to happen. Or if I say, I will go to the store, then if I don't put any time marker on that, then it's future. See, we understand plain English that way. But sometimes when we come to the Bible, we've got to start playing with the tenses of the word. But listen, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, shortly after Jesus said the kingdom was at hand, it says Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, or the good news of the kingdom. And he, he was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. So you know, I understand that he, it's pretty hard to proclaim the gospel of something that isn't a reality, but I suppose you could make the case that, well, Jesus would be proclaiming the gospel of something yet to come. I'll grant that. But let's go on and look at what the Bible says in other places. In Mark chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus was dealing with a scribe that, that uh, had some questions. And notice what Jesus said to the man. It says, when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, Jesus had asked him a question and he'd given the right answer. Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. Did you catch that? Jesus says at that day, in that hour, says you're not far from the kingdom of God. Well, once again, if the kingdom's yet to be uh, established, then that man who answered intelligently was a long way from the kingdom. Matthew 11, verse 12, it says, From the days of John the Baptist, until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. It was suffering violence in the first century. Matthew 13, 52. Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom is like the head of a household who brings out his treasure, things new and old. Once again, pay attention to the tense that Jesus used. Jesus did say, therefore, every scribe who will become a disciple of the kingdom, as if it's yet to come. Jesus says, no, every disciple who has become one already. Then in Matthew 23, as Jesus, as we say, was taking the Jewish leadership, the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyers to the woodshed over their abuses of God's people. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for this and that. Jesus, again, calling them on the carpet. Notice what he says in connection with the kingdom. He says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. How could they do that? How could they be doing that if it wasn't there? And notice as well, he says, For you do not enter yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering 
to go in. Apparently some people were in the process of entering the kingdom then. And the Pharisees were standing in the way. A couple of places in Luke for this point. It says Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John since that time gospel of the kingdom has been preached and everyone is forcing his way into it. Not will be forcing his way into it. Jesus says they're doing it. Then finally Luke 18, 16 Jesus gathers some children to him a tender scene. Jesus called for them saying permit the children to come to me and do not hinder him for the kingdom of heaven belongs such as these. Now that was a lot of verses there, and we could point to several others, but if you take scripture at face value in the way it said, the words of Jesus and the way he said them, Jesus referred, preached the gospel of the kingdom and referred to his disciples as being part of it in his day and time. That's instructive. But what about the later the letters written later to churches? How did the apostles, inspired by God, write about the things Jesus did during his ministry? By the time the, the letters in the New Testament were written, Jesus had already died and been resurrected and gone back to the Father. But notice the language used by those writers in reference to the kingdom of God. Nolan read this one from Colossians a, a little bit ago, but it's key to to what we're talking about this morning. Can okay, we read those verses? Colossians 1, starting in verse 9. Paul says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why, Paul? So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power, According to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks. Now catch these last two verses, verses 12 and 13, Colossians 1. Giving thanks, Paul says, to the Father who has qualified us, has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And what did God do? 4, verse 13. For he, or God, rescued us from the domain of darkness and did what? Transferred us, past tense, ED on the end of the word transfer there, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So Paul, speaking of himself, Paul was saved, and the saved people he was writing to, he says, God did something for us in the past. Upon our faith, Upon coming to faith, Paul says God took us from the kingdom of darkness. That's where we all reside because of our sin before salvation. But God takes us from there through the blood of his son and transferred us, Paul said, to the kingdom. Amen. Pretty hard to transfer you to something that doesn't exist. In 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 12. It refers to the fact in verse 12, it says, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom. God was in the process. There were some who had already been put into the kingdom of God. And Paul writes to the Thessalonians and says, God's calling you into that kingdom. The gospel continues to be preached and everyone who obeys the gospel continues to be added to that from the first century on. Book of Hebrews, chapter 12 and verse 28, contrasting there, the Hebrew writer does the, the old covenant, uh, Sinaitic covenant with the new covenant of God and all the blessings that come with the new covenant. He says, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. We are receiving, present tense, this kingdom couple of places in the book of Revelation that are very instructive here. John in the book of Revelation, I believe, was written just shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. But be that as it may, whenever it was written, it's a long time before today. 
And if you want to put the book of Revelation written in AD 90s, that's fine. I'll, I'll just grant that for sake of discussion here. But what does John say in the first chapter in a couple of places? Revelation 1 6, John writing to believers about the suffering that was coming. And the book of Revelation begins and ends by speaking of things that were to shortly take place and are coming soon the destruction of Jerusalem, and the, the church's. You know, the effect it would have upon believers. In Revelation 1 6, John says, He, speaking of Christ, of the Father, He has made us to be a kingdom, priest to His God and Father, to be to Him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God has made us a kingdom, He says in the first century. And then in verse 9, He says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker, where? In the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus. He says, I was on the Isle of Patmos, and that's where he got this vision. John says, I'm a fellow partaker currently in the kingdom of God. So the case continues to build, doesn't it? Amen. Much of the confusion, I believe, regarding the kingdom of God arises because of misunderstandings about the true nature of the kingdom. I, I really think this is at the root of the problem because there's a certain segment of Christendom out there that believes that the kingdom the Bible refers to is some physical earthly kingdom. And it doesn't take, you know, a, a thinking person very far to say, well, I don't see that physically on earth today yet, so it must be in our future. That's misunderstanding something about the kingdom God came to establish in Christ. In John 6, 15, you remember there was a time in Jesus' ministry after feeding a, 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 a huge crowd with just a small amount of food, the people put two and two together and it says, well, this is the kind of guy we want as a king. And so it says in John 6, 15 that uh, they came and were ready to take Jesus by force and make him king. That's verse 14, probably. But notice how Jesus responded to that. You know, if Jesus' purpose was to set up an earthly kingdom and throw out the Roman rule over the Jewish nation, if that was Jesus' purpose, what would have been the smart thing to do when you've got people begging you to be king? All right, I accept the nomination. You know, I'll be your king. If I'm setting up an earthly kingdom and people are begging me to do it, that's what ought to be done. But notice how Jesus responds. Jesus said, Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force and make him king, says he withdrew again to the mountains by himself to be alone. Why would Jesus do that? I would affirm it's because he didn't come to set up an earthly kingdom. And we know that later in the book of John, because in John 18, verse 36, is Jesus is being questioned by Pilate. Here, here he's right on the cusp of the cross. He's being grilled by the, the Jewish leadership, and then they take him to Pilate to be you know, trying to get a sentence of, of condemnation and crucifixion. Pilate and Jesus go back and forth, and what comes up? Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, if you will, this physical realm. Yeah, we're physical beings. We can become part of it, but... The kingdom itself is a spiritual reality. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, he says, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. See, that comes with a physical kingdom. Jesus says, that's not the type of kingdom I'm here to be king of. But as it is, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this realm. Jesus the kingdom of Jesus and of God and of heaven is a spiritual one. It's not kind of one that comes with human vision. You can't look at a particular piece of real estate today and say, well, that's part of the kingdom of God. The inhabitants might be or might not be, but the kingdom is spiritual. In Luke 17, verses 20 and 21, some Pharisees come to Jesus with a question about the kingdom. And you know what he says? He says, now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. 
Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. See, there's a verse we could have added to the previous point, right? There Jesus said the kingdom of God is in your midst, not will be. They were in the midst of that. So make no mistake about it, brothers and sisters. Jesus was reigning as king in the first century, and his reign continues today. I would affirm that with, with, with everything. The Bible seems to make it pretty clear to me. You know, maybe, maybe I'm missing something. But over and over again, we get this idea. Jesus said, in fact, in Matthew 16, 28, he says, Truly I say to you, there are some of you who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of man, of the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And you've either got a lot of pretty old people in the world, or it happened. Shortly before his ascension into heaven, in Matthew 28, verse 18, what did Jesus say in verse 18? He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. It has been given to me. Who's the one with all authority and power? It's the king. Jesus was king. That's why Peter could preach in Acts 2, verse 36, it should be. I've got 238 on the screen. It should be 236. Anyway, Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit of God has come upon the apostles with great power, and they're preaching the resurrected Christ. They get to the point where they are convicting the crowd of, of crucifying the Messiah. But based upon everything Paul said up to verse 36, Peter said, rather, he said, Therefore let the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, or Christ, both Lord and Christ, Jesus. God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you crucified. Now that, I'll admit that word, verse doesn't use the word king, but if you're both Lord and Christ, chances are you're king too. You've got all authority. In Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1, verses 18 through 22. This speaks very clearly to the authority that Christ had as the resurrected Christ in the first century and beyond. Paul there writes, I pray that the heart, eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of your calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. So Paul's writing to believers. He said, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. The right hand of God is the king of the universe, and Christ rules from his right hand as king. Which he brought about, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come, and he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him his hand over all things to the church. If, and again, given that language, if Christ isn't king, then who in the world is? Amen. That's why you read in places like Revelation chapter 11 and chapter 17. Again, Revelation there in verse chapter 11 verse 15 it says then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and Christ and he will reign forever and ever of course the, again in my view the book of Revelation is written about the events of AD 70 and the destruction of the, that was the, the fullness of the kingdom when Christ claimed all power and authority that's why he will reign forever and ever in chapter 17, a little bit later, verse 14, speaking of Christ's opponents, says these will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. Overcome them. Why? Because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Amen. And those who are with him will be called the chosen and faithful. One final point just to consider. Again, just to ask the question, is the kingdom of God a current reality? I believe biblically the answer for that is an unqualified yes. 
It has been in existence since the first century, according to Bible words, and it will continue, importantly, without end. Amen. Without end. Daniel 2, 44 speaks of in the days, in the context there, referring to the days of the Roman Empire. When Nebuchadnezzar sees this dream of a statue and Daniel's given the interpretation. He says, in the days of those kings, during the rule of the Roman Empire in the first century, of course, was in the, some of the height of that. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. See, there, there you've got future language because Daniel was written before all this happened in the first century. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. That kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but in itself will endure forever. And finally, Luke 1, verses 32 and 33, the angel Gabriel talking to the young virgin Mary, who was uh, to have a child who would become the Messiah. Speaking of that child, the, the angel says, and he will be great and will be called the son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Amen. Perhaps the question then left for us today is, we don't have to really debate about the kingdom. Right? The Bible affirms that it's a reality. The question we need to deal with is, am I part of that kingdom or not? Amen. Christ is ruling according to scriptures. And I want to be part of of Christ's kingdom. How about you? That's If that's the kingdom that's going to last forever, then I better be a part of that kingdom. Because as we just read, all other kingdoms will bow the knee to the kingdom of, of Christ. Are you, am I, part of the kingdom of God? By faith this morning, you can become part of the, the, the reality of the kingdom today. You can be part of the kingdom that Jesus preached and, and died for, that he established as he promised to do by faith, you can accept the gospel of God, the good news that God, through Christ, has done everything necessary for you to be saved, short of forcing you to do it. He offers it by faith. It's a gift that God holds out to you. By faith, obedient faith, we accept that gift. I would encourage you this morning to accept the salvation that God offers, the deliverance from sin, and become an important member of Christ's kingdom and rule with him forever and ever. Let's stand and sing.